Thank you all for joining us tonight. We are going to kick this off and get started. So if you wanna join us over here um, in the main area, I think you'll be able to better interact with the panel. Tonight, we are joined by four people who are really on the front lines of, of our topic tonight, which is digital asset and blockchain legal frameworks and regulation. Um, we're really pleased to host them here. And I think the idea is to get people from different backgrounds. So I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves in one minute. But we will have, you know, hopefully find some areas where people agree, hopefully some areas where they disagree, and really try to make this an interesting panel. We will be doing questions at the end, so I, I ask you to hold your questions until then. Um, tonight, they're going to share an insider view really into the advancements as well as frustrations and challenges of this space. Uh, I know many of you are also on the front line, so you'll be able to relate to that. And then we're going to look at what's next for the year ahead, always a popular topic. Um, tonight's panel is open session, so if you want to share any of the views of the panelists tonight, you are welcome to do so across Twitter or, you know, whatever channel you prefer. Um, so without further ado, we will go ahead and get started. I'm Claire Cart, and I'm the moderator for the evening. Um, I have the honor of being head of community at Ripple, so welcome to all of you. And I'll ask our panelists to introduce themselves. Valeria? Valeria Vistrovic. <laughs> Uh, I am a corporate attorney. I've been working with startups for around 10 years. And about three years ago, I joined Perkins Coie. It's considered to be like the lead law firm in the space. And for the last two and a half years, I've been working 100% in crypto projects. And I do mostly corporate and securities work and some regulatory work. Uh, hi, I'm Sarah Hody. My legal career actually started as a litigator for, um, we mostly represented financial services companies because I was in law school at a time when, um, when you're graduating and looking for a job, uh, financial services litigation is kind of a fancy way to say things like bankruptcy and collection. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it gave me really firsthand insight into how messed up even the financial system in the US kind of was. And so when I stumbled upon Bitcoin, um, I, you know, caught the bug that a lot of people catch about around thinking like, this is really cool. This could solve a lot of problems that exist in our current system. Um, and I had always also um, planned to go to law school so that I could eventually work in house. And so um, from there, I, I sort of found myself um, in house at Coinbase for a couple of years, starting in 2014. Um, and over time that became uh, more and more of a compliance heavy role. I was kind of doing a lot of the same stuff on uh, money transmission, money services work. And I sort of decided, um, okay, this is all really cool and really interesting. And this company is really awesome, but I want to do more. And um, so that's what led me to Perkins Coie about two years ago, where, um, as Larry said, we have a, a really robust blockchain fintech practice. Um, and so I get to do a lot of product counseling um, and, and basically regulatory advice for everything from um, crypto exchanges to qualified custodian work, to um, token sales, and some of the, the less exciting non-blockchain work in the fintech world of, um, you know, payments, um, which is not something. <laughs> hey, wait a second. Thank you, Eric. Um, my name is Eric Van Maltenberg. I'm Senior Vice President of Global Operations here at Ripple. Been here for just about two years. And in my role in global operations, I get a chance to do a lot of fun things, but specifically, I help to guide how Ripple expands into new geographies. We're, we're sort of an international company by definition, but there's certain markets where we um, has, have decided to make an investment to go deeper, to put more uh, people in market, to get a better sense of the market, the use cases, closer to our customers and partners so we can be more responsive. And so we're, we've, we've done that selectively across, uh, across the globe in certain, uh, certain hubs. Uh, prior to being at Ripple, I've been in Silicon Valley in the tech space for over 20 years. Um, always on the business side, doing everything from business development, corporate development strategy, business operations, you know, looking for opportunities to help companies scale, find the next thing and, and grow. And so, uh, you know, the opportunity to come here to Ripple and be a part of helping to build what we think is the next wave of technology is... Uh, I'm pretty exciting. So, 
Great. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I'm Kevin Werbeck. I am a professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania in legal studies, and I have the great fortune of being able to study emerging technologies that have significant business implications as well as significant legal and regulatory implications. And I became convinced a number of years ago that this blockchain cryptocurrency space was the most exciting, most interesting area of technology today and dove in head first. And uh, that led to uh, developing a book that uh, just came out called The Blockchain and the New Architecture of Trust, um, and really trying to articulate for broader business communities what's going on, what the real value proposition is in this area, as well as doing a lot of work, um, both teaching, working with regulators, working with people in industry on trying to work through the legal and policy issues. At the beginning of my career, I was at the Federal Communications Commission 20 years ago now during the early days of the commercial internet. And um, I'm happy to tell you, uh, the government didn't kill off the internet in case you were wondering, uh, but that was really the challenge that we faced uh, in the government doing internet policy at that point. And many people have made this analogy, but um, what's happening now in the blockchain world has many, many parallels to what happened during the early days of the internet. It's hard to know exactly where things are going to turn out, um, but I'm excited to be involved again at this early stage of this technology, um, working through those issues and uh, really appreciative of, of Ripple for hosting this uh, today and looking forward to the discussion. Great, thank you all so much. And we don't get introductions from everyone in the audience, but I would like to get a sense of your background. So if you would participate and just raise your hand if you are currently working in this space. Okay, a lot of people. Raise your hand if you're kind of interested in getting into it. You may be a student or thinking of changing industries or an entrepreneur. Okay, a couple people. All right, awesome. Well, welcome. I think we'll have a pretty high level of knowledge in the room then, given that many people are already working um, in the field. So that should generate some great conversation amongst panelists, as well as some great Q&A at the end. Um, to jump right in, I think the best place to start is to lay a foundation of really what the global business environment looks like and what the current state of affairs is. We have a very global perspective as well as um, interdisciplinary perspective. So uh, I think let's get started right there. Kevin, the first question is for you. You spent the last two years researching and writing your new book. Um, which we have some copies of in the back, um, Blockchain and the New Architecture of Trust. Um, what did you find in terms of foundational elements that are present or not present for really the business environment to evolve? What have you seen? Sure. Well, so the funny thing about writing a book about a fast moving technology area is that it takes you a substantial period of time to write the book. And then I turned in the final manuscript of this book the first week of January. So nothing at all has changed whatsoever in blockchain and crypto since the first week of January, right? Um, but, but actually that's a good thing because that forces you to try to abstract from the events of the day and the prices of different tokens and so forth and ask what's substantial. Um, and so, you know, to your question, we're still early in some areas on just the basic technical maturity. You need to distinguish between um, different kinds of blockchain and cryptocurrency networks. So if we're talking about the, the public um, permissionless blockchain networks like Bitcoin and Ethereum, there still are basic open questions about scalability, about interoperability, about the uh, consensus mechanisms and so forth um, that really need to be addressed. There are lots of smart people around the world working on them. Um, but we're certainly not at a point where you can say we're certain that these networks just technically will get to the point that they need to to really reach their potential. In other areas, there's a gap in understanding, and that's a lot of why I wrote the book. I was talking to many business executives, um, people in public policy and others who just said, look, I, I don't get this. Like, it's not, it's not that I'm skeptical. I just, I just do not understand either why anyone would want to use a cryptocurrency what the value is of a blockchain versus a traditional database, or just how is it possible to trust something as being valuable when there's, quote unquote, nothing standing behind it? So that's part of why I wrote the book, to make uh, articulate that. But I think in general, there's still a need for broader awareness. I mean, anyone who's in this space, you're in a bubble, 
right? If you are convinced that this is an important area, you're in a relatively small community within a larger business environment. So we need that broader awareness. We need uh, to find more killer applications. I think we, you know, there are clearly some application areas where the value proposition has been established, um, but especially in terms of widespread popular adoption, we don't yet have anything we can point to to say that this is certain to be something that's going to get widespread traction. And then the last thing is governance. Uh, and governance means different things in different contexts. In the decentralized cryptocurrency permissionless blockchain world, there's some really hard questions. How do you coordinate among a decentralized network where no one's in control? No one has power to say, this is the way we're going to go. Um, lots of interesting experiments and work going on to address that, but a really huge challenge because you need governance. Otherwise, when things go wrong, when things change, it's impossible for the system to adapt. But even in the permission world, the enterprise world, you still have this governance challenge because the potential of this technology is when you get competitors on the same platform because they're willing to, to use the decentralized ledger technology precisely because it's one shared source of truth as opposed to everyone keeping their own information um, and having to duplicate the system because they don't trust each other. And actually that's still a hard governance problem. It's still a hard problem to figure out how you convince a company to give up control. Uh, you can prove to them technically that the system works, that the cryptography works, um, but there's still a process. And so I think that's what we're seeing now in a lot of companies is saying, well, I, I sort of get it at a high level, but I really need to be convinced in this application um, that the promise is there, that this truly works in a decentralized way that doesn't empower any particular actor. So I think we still need a lot more work in that area really for maturation of the industry. Eric, next question is for you. You are really on the front lines um, taking Ripple into new markets. And so you have visibility into kind of the global environment. Um, how would you characterize um, kind of the landscape right now? And would you say that any geographies are ahead or behind? Um, curious to hear your thoughts on that. Or, uh, absolutely. Maybe I'll start. I assume people are somewhat familiar with Ripple, but you know, we come to the market with a, a product. We serve financial institutions, and we have a very, very sharp focus. Our focus is on helping to remove the friction from cross-border payments. So by definition, we're an international company. There's no, there's no domestic version of Ripple. So to your point, Claire, we, we, we are out there um, you know, operating in geographies around the world. What also makes us a little bit different than a lot of other folks in the space is that we have a strong opinion that we want to uh, work with governments, with regulators, um, with policymakers. We're not trying to be that libertarian, uh, anarchistic, you know, we're going to um, you know, sideswipe and, and get around the man. So we've been engaged for years with regulators. I think we have relationships with other, over 40 regulatory bodies around the world, and we certainly see differences as you look to those different um, bodies of regulators and, and how far they've advanced the state of the art in terms of how they um, are, are laying out the frameworks for regulatory clarity. Um, uh, you know, we've spoken to people from everywhere in the U.S. to the Philippines to uh, India to the UAE, et cetera, et cetera. And I guess I'd highlight um, the the ASEAN countries, Southeast Asia, as a set of of jurisdictions where there is, I think, a uh, a notable um, positive development in terms of clarity. You look to Thailand, for example. It started the year, um, and the Bank of Thailand came out with relatively stringent, conservative, you know, blockchain is bad, very restrictive regulations. But they quickly in, dug in, and towards the middle of the year, you saw, you know, a a, a you know, licensing framework for exchanges. You saw classifications for crypto uh, assets that really provided clarity for companies who wanted to operate in that geography as to what was allowed and what wasn't. And you see advancements there. Philippines, you know, early on, they, they provided licensing clarity uh, around the space. Uh, um, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, again, very uh, progressive in how they're, they're trying to set a standard and uh, really educate the, the, all the constituents as to what works and what doesn't. And I, I don't think it's a coincidence. It's happening in this part of the world. 
you know, there was uh, $130 billion roughly of remittances flowing into Eastern Asia last year. And that's happening at a time where the legacy uh, technology involved with uh, moving money through the correspondent banking world is, is withdrawing. There's fewer and fewer banks maintaining their correspondent relationships. So the friction has increased in terms of cross-border money movement. And I think you see these, these regulators, you see these jurisdictions um, looking to the blockchain and this technology as being a way to reduce the friction, move to the next wave, and realizing that to, to sort of pave the road, they need to provide that, that clarity from a regulatory standpoint sooner rather than later. So I think that's a, it's a real positive development, and I think it's a model that other parts of the, the world uh, really should take note of as they... Great, thank you. Um, Sarah and Valeria, I know you work really closely together at Perkins Cooey, kind of on different sides of the house, but I'm gonna direct the next question to the both of you. Um, I think you're probably collaborating on these types of things very frequently. Um, so feel free to jump in with your, your own unique perspective. But there's been a lot of developments lately in our space. The SEC took action against Air Fox and Paragon. Consensus announced that they're laying off 13% of their workforce. Um, these are headlines that I don't think anyone in the room can avoid. They're popping up like every second on my feed. So my question is, you're really on the front lines advising businesses on how to navigate this environment. So do you see any of the clients that you advise changing strategy or how are they reacting to, to these developments? Want me to go first? <laughs> so I am kind of like at the beginning of the process because I help a lot with funding. And I will say that what we're seeing is people that is coming with new projects, they are kind of like going more towards the traditional financing route and looking to get financing through equity. We are seeing more institutional investors get in the space, and that comes at a price. You know, the, basically, if you have an institutional investor willing to invest, they are going to want to do a deep, thorough diligence process, not only in the traditional startup world, but also they want to know about crypto-specific. They're going to look at your total supply, how the founders are investing their tokens, if you have lockups. So it's, it's not as the craze in 2017 where it was kind of like, give me your money, I give you nothing, we're done. You know, <laughs> so it's kind of like, they wanna see, they wanna see the team, they wanna see the product. Then we have a lot of clients that have already finalized their pre-sale and they were ready to go public. And the position of our firm at least is we're not doing any public sales until we hear from the SEC and we get clear guidelines. So those people are in a, tough position because are like in wait and see mode. A lot of them are thinking of engaging with, with regulators. You know, the SEC has been very vocal about come and talk to us. There's a fine line because you want to be open and proactive, but at the same time, you don't want the spotlight on you. And then they get to tell you that everything you're doing is wrong. And so we're helping clients strategize with that. We have other group of clients which are like, we want to stay away from the U.S., help us do everything so we don't have to, yeah. And that we could rely on regs, but it gets very tricky. So, and then you have other people that is just like trying to see of solutions that may eventually use blockchain, but it's not really necessary right now. So they're going the more traditional route. So that, that's, I think, is what, what I'm seeing, at least at the beginning of the process. Sarah, what are you seeing? Yeah, so from my perspective, um, I I think the diff biggest difference for me is actually more just in what my workload is because I'm usually less involved in, in financing and fundings and normally you're coming and asking for regulatory product advice once you probably already have money. Um, and so for me, the biggest difference is a year and a half ago, I was getting asked quite frequently to help write um, regulatory memos on proposed token sales or proposed token projects. And that was, I don't know, maybe 70 to 80% of my workload for a couple months of 2017. Um, I would say for me, it's it's just gone back to what it had previously been, which is that I work a lot with exchanges. I work with, um, you know, custodian projects. And I also do a good amount of work with um, 
uh, projects that are building on what I would call decentralized exchanges, building relayers or um, projects on top of relayers. And I guess kind of to your, your um, point about layoffs, I think we were, as panelists all chatting about this earlier, how we're not really seeing a lot of people leave this space. So even where people leave jobs, uh, we see them go, I think so far at least, we've largely seen them go into just other roles in the industry. Um, and so, uh, you know, some of the clients I work with are former Coinbase colleagues who then left to go start their own projects. Um, uh, in the again in like the decentralized exchange space or there are um, crypto hedge funds or or I don't even know a lot of them don't even like to be called hedge funds because they're more funds in a in a kind of new sense of the word um so so the difference for me is more just the the stuff I get to spend my time on and I wouldn't say that the regulatory change has really spurred any difference I think uh if anything those who took our advice, our, our regulatory advice a year or so ago to um, start engaging with regulators sooner rather than later are probably glad they did that um, because what we said at the time, which I think is still true, is uh, you don't want the first time you engage with a regulator to be when they have some kind of inquiry or enforcement action. Um, Good advice. And, and uh, you know, at, at first, uh, they're, uh, you know, entrepreneurs, especially in the technology space, tend to be like, oh my gosh, that's really scary. Like, why would we ever want to talk to regulators if we don't have to? Um, but they're, they've, they've been very receptive. They, meaning regulators, have been very receptive to engaging with the industry. They want to learn. They realize they can't ignore it. Um, and so I think the, the folks who are open to engaging with regulators and figuring out a, a best path forward are um, probably... It might be painful in the short term, but in the long term are going to be best positioned to, to grow and succeed as a company. Yeah, and, a, and, a, and a caveat I will add to that, and I'm not trying to sell our services, <laughs> <laughs> but if you decide to go engage with the regulators, plan ahead, have a strategy with your attorneys or with whoever, but just don't go call like, hey, this is my project. I want Because it is a fine line, you know, you don't want to be like the scapegoat, so be ready when you go there and talk to them. Good advice. I think, too, it's, it's interesting to see how I think there was a wave of innovation that was taking place, you know, here where we all are today in Silicon Valley that was sort of like um, kind of uh, what's the saying where you ask for forgiveness, not permission, and you just enter new markets and, you know, kind of deal with the regulatory fallout on the back end. Um, I think we may all know the company I'm referencing. They filed for IPO recently, and there are many others kind of in the same vein. But it's interesting because because this space touches financial services so much and is so highly regulated. And I think you know regulators have a very important role to play. It's good to hear. Securities and securities and it's like everything. <laughs> yeah, so it's good to hear that that you're advising people to engage early. And it's also good to hear that I think the climate is shifting more around active engagement as opposed to the ask for forgiveness, not permission model, which I don't ascribe to. But Eric um, and Kevin, I saw you nodding. Do you want to jump in on any of their points or going? No, I, I would agree. I think just what we see flux this whole um, openness and willingness of the regulators to engage. I mean, it's really an education process. Everybody's trying to figure out what this is and, and honestly also what it isn't. And the, the, the confusion and some of the, the legacy stuff that wasn't so savory that you know, came with the start of the blockchain uh, activity is still weighing on people's minds. So just making sure that, that really you're bringing them along in this journey and they're, and they're eager to do that, it's an important. Also, I think that like going to a lower level, like Kevin was saying, there's a lot of people that don't get it. And... There's not only like all oh, risk adverse, or they don't want to like regulators are still trying to understand it. Sometimes we are still trying to understand, it, you know, in certain cases. So it's all the time, so you you have to. Yeah. Keep. And the problem. So the other thing is, uh, you know, I talked to a lot of entrepreneurs in this space who say, well, we just want the regulators to you know tell us where the lines are, give us a bright line guidance. You do this, it's okay. You do this, uh, you know, we'll make you give back the money. You do this, you go to jail. And that's generally not how regulation works in emerging areas, at least in this country, um, because we tend to have a very kind of case-by-case -case approach. And, and we're dealing with 
new kinds of situations. Um, and the regulators, frankly, are in a really challenging position because I don't think they want to shut off innovation, but we're talking about people's money here. And there are a lot of bad actors out there. And there are a lot of questions about protection um, of ordinary investors. So, uh, you know, it's it's a challenge. And, and I think anyone who goes in thinking, well, you know, I, I just want an answer and it's going to come out needs to have some uh, some fortitude uh, and some willingness to to deal with the uncertainty. Um, I do think there is another shoe left to drop with the the bad actors, um, which is not the people who did a token sale and didn't register as a security, even if that's ultimately what's determined. It's the fraud, the scams, the the front running on the exchanges, the questionable stable tokens, all sorts of activity um, where there's you know there's going to be evidence that that people are doing things that's abusing the system and manipulating the system and. You know, I think the regulators are going to have to address that here and in other jurisdictions, and the market's going to overreact. I think it already has, but that's the reality that when you see actual enforcement actions, ultimately it helps the companies that are trying to do the right thing. I think the regulators understand when they see companies saying, you know, look, we, we were trying to follow the law as we understood it. We want to work with you. Um, then in the long run, they're going to be okay. But I, I still think, you know, in the, the coming year or two, we're going to have to deal with that situation because the reality is you look globally and a lot of this is more outside the United States, but it's an interconnected system. Um, there's still a lot of that that needs to be worked out. So a lot of the panelists have referenced some of the barriers that this industry faces and in really moving forward. And I'd like to dig in on that a little bit. And I think this is where maybe some of our difference of opinions may come out. So it should be interesting. Um, first question is again for Sarah and Valeria. Um, I think sometimes if you read crypto or digital asset or blockchain news or go to events enough, there is this palatable anxiety that perhaps the United States will get left behind. Um, perhaps we're slow to come up with these legal and regulatory frameworks, and as a result, um, we're going to get left behind, and this won't be a hub of innovation like it was for the Internet and all of the prosperity that um, really produced for us. How would you respond to that? And what is your perspective on the U.S.'s position? You want me to go first? All right, I'm first this time. Um, so I don't think it's that big of a concern, um, at least not anytime soon. And the reason is that a lot of um, benefits come from clarity. And although it feels painful now, um, you know, a, a regulatory year is like light years in, in emerging technologies. Um, it's, it's still reasonably fast. And the amount of certainty that then comes with it is a huge competitive advantage, not just from the standpoint of where you stand with regulators, but also uh, how you raise capital, um, which is the other reason why I don't think we're anywhere near the verge of the US falling off the map, um, because I don't think the capital is gonna move that quickly. Uh, my one caveat to that is I, I think there is a lot going on um, in Asia that I'm not aware of um, that I, you know I think Probably I just I haven't followed it that much and I certainly hear like rumblings that there's a lot happening there. But um, but the reality is, I think we're going to get greater regulatory clarity in the next year or two. And even if that feels like a really long time, I think it's going to take a lot longer than a year or two for uh, all of the capital investment in the U.S. to start funding projects from like coders in Russia. Um, they're still going to probably want a Delaware C Corp and, you know, some, some boots on the ground in the U.S. Yeah, and I kind of like share a similar view. We have discussed this in the past, and I think there's no immediate concern yet. Uh, you know, the U.S. has been at the front line of technology for a long time, and I think it has a huge ability to adapt. And I do think we're going to see clarity soon now. If you would have asked me this in 2017, I would have been more concerned because I think one of the nice things that the ICO brought was like they open the financing role. You know, before it was just the US and Silicon Valley, whereas with the ICOs, people was able to go to other markets, international, get funding. Crypto prices, you know, portfolios being the way they are is not helping. So I think 
we're good that there is a lot of competition for many jurisdictions trying to, to get in because there's a lot of money in the space. And again, Asia is being they are have they have big players and they're moving fast. So yeah, not an immediate risk, but I wouldn't rest in my laurels. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um Eric, you are really a Silicon Valley veteran and you were around during the wild wild west days of the early internet in the in the 90s um not to date you sorry about that but <laughs> we're all looking forward to i guess hearing your wisdom and perspective on on that and specifically you know i think what we all saw from that is the united states benefited so much in terms of a national security perspective a lot of economic prosperity was created and i think looking back on that many people attribute that to really leading from a leg um, legal regulation framework standpoint. So how would you compare now to then? And Kevin, you might want to jump in on this too, because I know you were also very much at the heart of it. So that was a nice way of saying that I'm old and that's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. I think, I think the point you bring up is a great one. The, the, the regulatory climate around the internet 20 plus years ago, it started off similarly somewhat shaky. There was, you know, Congress in the U.S. <laughs> was very skeptical. You know, a lot of evil things happened on the internet, banned the internet. And then you saw progression, you know, in the, in the Clinton administration, they lay out, laid out a very clear framework for, for e-commerce. Again, they, they, they started moving away from regulating the technology to regulate, regulating specific activities. You know, what do you do with the technology? And, and there are things that you can do with uh, technology that are bad and those those that are very very helpful and i think you saw that that um that framework that that was laid out around e-commerce turned out to be a global standard and as a result at least for a while you may not argue that today but uh, u.s companies were predominantly leaders and and at the forefront of the the e-commerce movement fast forward 20 years you do see similar trends the parallels that that, that kevin pointed out i fully believe in you know you, you know uh, Initially, the, the the start of what was being done with blockchain and Bitcoin and Silk Road and a lot of bad things, and you have people who are trying to learn. And the easiest response we were talking about this a little bit earlier is, is you know, I'm no uh, or I don't know because they're still trying to figure it out. And I, I I do feel maybe a little less optimistic in terms of the U.S. being in a in a safe position. I don't think anything's going to fall off the cliff in the next year or or or, or next couple of quarters. But given my earlier remarks, there are um, uh, jurisdictions. Asia definitely is one. Uh, there are things happening you know, in, in Switzerland, UK, uh, UAE, where they're, they're really trying to take the lead and, and, and set a standard. And you know, once you do set a standard, you create a very friendly environment for innovation and economic prosperity. Then you have a lot of investment being made within China and within Russia around trying to be a predominant force in terms of the next generation of how fintech evolves uh, you know and, and even if you look at two of the most popular uh, tokens out there bitcoin and ethereum you know the vast majority of the mining uh power is within china right now you know 80 plus percent and that in effect is control now if you look at at, at the us it you know it's notable at least to me that uh, around june of this year director hinman of the sec came out and said kind of in a black and white way both Bitcoin and Ethereum, they're not securities. Silent on every other token out there. Um, not saying that they're bad, but also not saying that that they're not securities. So that puts those projects, those companies, sort of in a in a limbo position. You know, that lack of clarity. Ironically, the U.S. companies that are not greenlighted are put in a bit of a disadvantaged situation, whereas these two tokens, Ethereum and Bitcoin. Which, per my earlier point, uh, there's a lot of, of uh, center of gravity and control within China have been given a green light. That's that's not necessarily a formula, in my opinion, to set you know U.S. companies up for success going forward. So I think you know the, the, there is opportunity to move a little more quickly than we've seen to provide that clarity to coordinate um, you know with regulators around the world. Honestly, to have kind of a, 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 a uniform or at least coordinated perspective that will ensure that, that the U.S. can have a, a real um, uh, solid, strong position in what you know, at least many of us in this room believe is going to be a, an important technology going forward as opposed to being relegated to a, you know, a second chair. 
Kevin, you are an insider on all of this. I mean, you <laughs> you were at the FTC. Yeah, in the no, so I, I actually and helped so write that White House report in 1998. <laughs> talked about. So uh, give Anna, give Anna, us your FTC point of view. Before. Yeah, like yeah. help us all be a fly on the wall of what that looked like and how it compares now. Because again, you are working with regulators, so I'm very curious how you weigh in on this question of the U.S. remaining competitive and do you feel we're moving fast enough? Yeah, I don't think it's a question of, of moving fast enough. Um, so the difference is in 1998, when the U.S. put out a framework for global electronic commerce, the whole rest of the world had to respond because all, all the activity really was here. This is where the development was, this is where the capital formation was, the whole Silicon Valley startup ecosystem was, and the rest of the world wanted to develop an internet uh, economy um, but it, it didn't have it yet. So it couldn't say, well, we're going to regulate more than the U.S. Um, so we could basically drive the agenda. Um, today, the U.S. is still in a very significant position. But you look at the development activity, you look at the adoption, you look at a lot of the economic activity in the blockchain space, and it's much more global. There's, there's much more happening in other areas. The U.S. is still in, in a very preeminent position, and I, I would you know, agree with what most of the panelists have said. It's not a matter that the U.S. has to be the, the fastest uh, or all the capital is going to somehow flow somewhere else and all the entrepreneurs, everyone's going to pick up and leak Silicon Valley and move to Gibraltar or Malta. Um, that's just not going to happen. Um, but uh, it is an environment where we need to take into account what's happening in other places in a different way. Um, the other thing that's different is that the financial boom happened quicker this time. I mean, you could go back, if you start the, the tape at the Bitcoin white paper 10 years ago, then it looks like 10 years. But, but really, you know, it's, it's only the last five years or so, and, and maybe even less than that, that this has been more than a fairly small community uh, and a small level of economic activity. Um, and so the development has been relatively quick to get to the point where we had this massive ICO boom. In the internet revolution, it was at least five years from the time of the, the real take up and adoption of some of the first commercial internet services that the Yahoo's and Amazon's and Ebay's of the world launched and actually had real adoption um, fairly early on before we had the 98, 99.com bubble. So um, in this world, um, we've got a lot of activity, a lot of incredibly promising projects, things that I think are not just you know, purely speculative, um, but still early on in terms of you want to say, you know, how much is there mainstream adoption? What are, what are applications that millions of people today are actually using other than investing in uh, tokens? Fairly limited. Uh, lots and lots of enterprises um, uh, doing tests, starting to go into production, ramping up services, um, starting to use services like Ripple services, but, yeah, but still relative to the overall market, still relatively small. So we have this sort of, in one hand, compression of timescales. It feels like we're much further along than we actually are. Um, and I think there's still an opportunity. That, you know, that's why I talk about trust in the book. Um, trust in the integrity of the ledger itself is not enough to trust the system. And what we really need is an environment where there's broad scale trust in these uh, entire ecosystems, in these entire application platforms. I mean, that takes time uh, and that requires a degree of confidence that the bad actors will be addressed uh, and that there is clarity. And so I, I think we're still at a point where uh, I'm not particularly worried that the U.S. is going to somehow not be the, the kind of place it is in the, the global capital system and the global innovation ecosystem. But there's no question. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of activity in other places, many different parts of the world, um, that are much more competitive with the U.S. than we saw in the early days of the Internet. Thank you. Um, we've had some really robust questions and answers from everybody. So um, I want to ask what will be the last question, but I want to get perspective from all of you on this. Um, so leaving time for audience questions, because I think a lot of you have been taking notes and we'll have some good ones. I want to know what your predictions are for 2019. I don't think this would be a panel on digital assets and blockchain if we didn't ask for predictions, not price predictions, please. Um, but I want to know what you think will come about in the next year and if it will be painful or not. Well. I think it's been painful enough, at least <laughs> for me, advising clients on 
what to do when there are no rules hasn't been easy. And I think in that sense, it should just get easier. I mean, we're having regulation by enforcement and by public statements, and I think we're getting closer to, to getting clearer guidelines. Um, what, what I would like to see, and this is more like, I don't know if it's going to happen, but I think it's time, like I was saying before, to deliver. I feel at the end of the day, we all can love blockchain and love, you know, the philosophy behind, but these are products and businesses and people want to buy real solutions and they are not buying blockchain. They are buying something that is going to make their life easier. And, and that's what I tied to like the international community because I feel like in the U.S. it was huge, the craze with the speculation, but things work here. Like I use PayPal and then I'm like, yeah, I love blockchain, but PayPal is awesome, you know, it's like it's so easy. Whereas in other parts of the world, the friction is unbelievable and you can really have an impact in people's lives by using this technology. So what I'm hoping is I think regulatory, you know, that regulators are going to get up to speed with the technology and a lot of fact patterns are going to play out so they'll have more things to say. And, and act on. So I think that's going to be better. And I hope we see deliverables, you know. Time to see to the build. Right? <laughs> it's time to see the products. <laughs> Agree. Thank you. Sarah? Yeah, so I think the um, the lawyerly answer to the question of will it will be painful is it depends. Um, I think that some of the clarity, I, I agree that we're going to see greater clarity. I think that some of the reason we're going to see it is because we're going to see more litigation. Um, and I am so glad that that is not part of my job anymore. But um, I think the we're already actually starting to see, if you haven't followed, they, they've kind of flown under the radar, but a couple of um, uh, sort of, lower matters, but in, in kind of high profile cases have had um, judges issue orders in recent weeks that um, I think it's going to really put regulators like the SEC and CFTC and others who we care a lot about uh, on their toes, because if judges are coming out with orders denying motions or or what have you that um, that maybe contradict public statements that a commissioner have, has made or or at least call it into question. Um, the clarity is going to have to come uh, one way or the other. It's going to get teased out. So uh, if you're on the wrong side of that litigation, it is not, it's going to be a painful year. <laughs> um, but I think overall, the industry is going to be stronger in 2019. Um, and I agree also with what Valeria said about it's time to see products. It's time to see people actually using um, the, the various things that, that we're all excited to see. Um, I think one of my uh, one of the things I care most about is is the notion of self-sovereign identity, um, because I also agree that PayPal and Venmo and Square Cash are all Facebook Messenger, for that matter, is <laughs> really easy to make payments to people. Um, we kind of abstract in the background all of the, the painful parts there. But um, there are other things that really do call for distributed systems and um, and also in emerging markets, pay payments call for that as well. But um, But I think... Someone said this recently, or maybe I read it on Twitter, um, kind of thinking about the early days of the internet, that uh, that waiting for the next crypto bubble is going to be like everyone who in 2001 was waiting for the next dot-com bubble, and it never really came. But 10 years later, you were like, wow, the internet's everywhere. Um, so in terms of predictions, I don't actually predict we're going to see that much different a year from now. Maybe I'm a pessimist, but I do think that um, maybe maybe three or five years from now, we're all going to look back and there's going to be kind of blockchain powering everything and behind lots of products we use. We may not see it. That's right. We'll be using it. That's right. <laughs> you. Eric? Kevin? Uh, sure. Well, so for some people, it's going to be really painful um, because, as I said, there is this other regulatory shoe to drop in lots of areas. There's an international group called the Financial Asset and Tax Force that deals with money laundering regulation, which is coordinating across jurisdictions and is, is very serious among many countries in trying to address the, the potential for using cryptocurrencies for money laundering. That, that does not mean Everyone in this space is at risk. There, there's many companies that have any money laundering processes in place, um, but there's lots of parts of the space that don't. And, and you know, the the sort of second wave of follow-on uh, from the fallout from the the ICOs is is going to happen. Um, but 
people are going to be building things. Uh, and I think if you're in a position where you're not uh, dependent on that, I, I think we're going to see more of the maturation of this world. Um, and some of the areas that are going to move fastest are not going to be the areas that are necessarily the most radically transformative. There's tremendous uptake by Wall Street in security tokens and crypto asset um, financial products um, that are not really based on transforming anything. It's just saying, well, okay, here's a new asset class and here's a digital asset class that I can use to create new kinds of financial products. I know how to do that. I'm an investment bank. I do that at large scale. Uh, and I want to take advantage of the programmability of these new digital assets. I don't care about any of the stuff underneath it. Um, I think that's going to see very significant ramp up over the next year. Uh, I think on the enterprise side with many of the distributed ledger technology projects, I think we're going to see a lot of these things start to go into production uh, and start to see some real take up among some of the consortiums that are well thought out this year. Not all of them, but I think we're going to start to see that. And then I think on the, the more uh, innovative kind of uh, distributed application uh, uh, context, we're going to see you know, a lot of building, a lot of focus on having to deliver real solutions that real people are going to want to use, um, as opposed to getting too caught up in the frenzy. So again, it depends what position you're in, if you're now set up to, to deal with that kind of environment, um, whether or not it's going to be painful to you. Um, and the, the last thing um, that I'll say is I'm not so worried, as I said, about the U.S. falling behind from a regulatory standpoint, um, but I am somewhat worried uh, when I talk to governments in other countries, not, not the regulators, but the, the national governments, um, because I've talked to a number of them who are saying, we need a blockchain strategy. We think this is a transformative technology. It will be essential for government services. It will be essential for economic development. It's an area where we want to fund research. Uh, and we think government can really play a role in coordinating the uptake of this technology. And they are developing national strategies and providing support for industry in this area. And I don't see as much of that happening here. Um, and I think long term, that's a challenge um, because, again, I think the U.S. is in a, in a very valuable position. Um, but the developers can really be anywhere. So I don't think that's going to change overnight in the next year. Um, but I think we're going to start to see the impact in the next year of some of those jurisdictions, lots of activity in Europe and in individual countries and across the European Union, uh, and lots of activity in some of the Asian jurisdictions, where I think the government affirmative investment, both financial um, and operational, in trying to facilitate the, the uh, payoffs from this technology, I think we're going to start to see fruit in ways that we're not going to see here. Um, I'll, three quick ones. Um, one, I'll, I'll echo Valeria's in terms of we'll see real projects come to light in a shameless, shameless plug is, you know, I think we're already showing that. I mean, we, we, we've been focused on a real use case. We have over a hundred you know, financial institutions as customers, we're in deployment, we're moving real money with this, this blockchain technology. So I think we're certainly gonna make bigger progress there, but I think you're right, we'll see more of that too. Uh, building a little bit on, on, on Kevin's point, I think uh, banks will sort of see a tipping point. We actually had commissioned some research, some third-party research this year, that, and, and they're saying that we're on the cusps of banks sort of embracing uh, this technology in, in a bigger way. And I think one particular manifestation of that will be around banks custodying digital assets. It's an obvious need. It is a new asset class. They're in the business of, of custodying assets, and this is one they should should do as well. It's a pain point that exists, especially with this technology. So I think you're going to see more and more of that. And then third, maybe uh, extrapolating on what I mentioned before we're seeing in Asia, I think some of the regulatory um, evolution will be moving from regulating the technology to seeing a much broader um, embrace of regulating the specific activity. So being more thoughtful about the use cases and what you know what consumers and others need real protection from versus this sort of uh, blunt instrument. Uh, you know, it, blockchain is good or digital assets are good or bad. It's it's more subtle than that. I think the regulators are getting to a point where they'll be able to. To, to provide that clarity in a more thoughtful, uh, informed way. Well, thank you all so much. Before we thank our panelists, I want to um, thank all of you for coming. This was our first edition of what we hope is more in the expert view.
series. So I hope to see you all back here um, in the new year, and I hope you'll join us at other events that we throughout. Um, we are working to really spotlight these credible voices in the industry because I think that um, while this is a very exciting time, it's important to talk to real practitioners who are seeing this from multiple different angles and and listen to those credible voices. So thank all of you so much. Um, we have a few books of Kevin that um, are, are back by kind of our AV setup back there in the room. So um, we don't have enough for the whole audience, unfortunately, but we do have a few. So I encourage you to go back there and get one if you're interested. Kevin has offered to sign some of them and there are pens back there if you'd like to do that. We also have some Ripple t-shirts to thank all of you for coming. Um, and we have some food and beverages and networking till about eight o'clock. So I welcome you to join us for that. Um, we're going to have a few audience questions and then we will thank our panelists and conclude. So are there any questions in the audience? I'm going to um, hand you the microphone so that we can record the audio and I'll come and circulate it now. Hi, um, I'm Professor Ling from SF State. Uh, I teach uh, financial technology in my alternative investment class. This is a new, brand new field for me, and uh, also my students are very curious about this. I have two questions. The first question is uh, to Eric. You just said 80% uh, of the mining machines for Bitcoin and Ethereum is in China. Uh, are in China. So is it theoretically possible for Chinese government to shut these two things down once, once and for all? Theoretically, I mean, um, well, well, tell them what to do. Like, who I, do I think take? that's I think that's unlikely. It would be short-sighted, and and, okay. and, and um, uh, I don't think it's in the in the long-term okay. best interest of of certainly of the of the ecosystem, and, and I don't think so for China. But the possibility I think exists, okay. and it's it is sort of you know tied to the the proof of work um, you know, consensus method and the, the fact that that cheap energy and the ability to of economies of scale, really to allow that sort of disproportional power, um, can go in an ironic way to a to an extreme that may not be within the spirit of where you know the technology started. Hi. So um, my question is actually about the sort of focus of the regulatory clarity on sort of. Well, so our discussions have been mostly about the sort of investor and network creator axis, but we also sort of have a consumer producer axis for participants in the economies after they're launched, the consumers of the services that have tokens involved in them, and whether or not there's any sort of, whether we have see a separate timeline for clarity around participation as opposed to launching, especially in light of discussion that sort of it's activity, not technology, that we would expect to be regulated, directed at the lawyers mostly. So my take on that is actually we, we have a reasonable amount of clarity on that already. Um, and I guess this goes to the, the point about more broadly how the Internet is regulated and how existing fintech is regulated, which is that specific services often have consumer protection rules attached to them. And so whether that's um, data privacy or, you know, dis disclosure requirements, receipt requirements, um, requirements around custodying other people's assets if you're if you know paypal is a great example actually of um paypal is regulated the same way that coinbase is regulated so um if you're if you're trusting a fintech company to hold your dollars you're also trusting them to hold your bitcoin um it's a very similar uh consumer protection facing regime and so the rules that apply to those businesses and, and the people using them that that makes so the point of the question, though, is when the service being rendered is diffused over a decentralized network, if we're talking about, you know, imposing that on the thing you architected and deployed in the first place, but then the subservices are sort of pro provided in a sort of diffused way by sort of, you know, even pseudonymous or even named participants, like how does the responsibility that would go to, if it were, say, Uber or Airbnb as providing a platform versus, say, now the computation and execution of what you architected is now not you at all, but actually some diffuse set of parties. Yeah, I think that's going to end up being highly situation dependent and industry dependent. And I, I, I mean that actually, honestly, and not as a joke, because um, the, the reality is, um, in some instances, I think you'll see regulators 
probably like if it's if it's a serious enough issue, they'll probably try to look to the people who deployed the code in the first place. Um, and, and to an extent, we've seen that already with with decentralized exchange platforms. Um, but I also think that that's not an argument that holds up super well across the board when you have things like free speech and, and if code is speech, then just publishing it um, probably isn't a crime. So I really do think it's going to, it's kind of the analytical answer today that you might give for a particular scenario is probably going to play out to be something different as, as regulators evolve over time. I, I also think there's not a clear accent and answer to your question, because the truth is, we are still at the early stages, and that's why the regulators are kind of like not knowing what to do. Nobody knows because we still don't know how these play, things are going to play out. You know, we we know the theory. We need to see the deliverables and see how they're going to play out in reality. Yeah, and regulators respond to problems. So if you're talking about something like consumer protection, the, the Federal Trade Commission, which is the general consumer protection regulator, has a blockchain team. They've brought enforcement actions already. Um, they're not going to step in and say what architecturally should happen with decentralized platforms. They're going to say, all right, here's a situation where someone has suffered a loss. There's been some fraud or some violation. What can be done about it? And then they're going to look at the particular situation. And, and you know, a lot of these platforms, it turns out, today are less decentralized when you pull back the covers than it seems in theory. Um, but but they're going to focus in on on where the problems happen and what to do about it, and and it's going to be the same kind of thing. The entrepreneurs, the technologists, are going to have to come in and talk and explain what they're doing, explain the positive value of the decentralization, um, and address what the problems are, and and that's just something that's going to take some time. We have time for one, maybe two short questions, or one longer one. Um... Hi, uh, my name is Paul. I'm based in Hong Kong. So this is uh, directed at Eric. Uh, increasingly in Asia, and it's also true in Europe, you're seeing um, governments move toward restricting cross-border data flows, data localization requirements, big, big potential markets of yours, India, China. Uh, Europe has this, uh, since May of this year, the uh, general data protection regulation, so you cannot transfer personal data to a country that it doesn't have um, its stamp of approval. And in Asia, there's only one country that currently has that, it's New Zealand. Um, so how is that affecting Ripple and how are you dealing with it? I mean, I, it's a fair point. You know, as Ripple from a technology standpoint isn't really getting in the middle of the data flow, if you will. We're not holding user data. We don't store it. We don't even really look at it. We're really providing a technology layer. So if you think about the things that are already happen with cross-border payment flows, um, be it you know KYC or anti-money laundering, you know, all those checks that happen still happen and they're being done by the financial institutions that were doing them before. So from our perspective, we certainly are staying abreast of it and we want to, to be responsive so that we can help our customers, the financial institutions, be responsive and responsible in what they are, are doing to stay compliant. But uh, you know, it's not that Ripple is is changing the flow of data or or any way um, holding that data. We're simply a, a a facilitator, if you will, a technology provider. And oftentimes we'll go in and we'll talk to regulators, and really it's education. We're telling them what we do, and then after uh, a few questions, they're like, "Well, wait a second, so you're not holding the data. You know, so you're just providing software." We're like, yeah, "That that's what we do." We're like, why are you talking to us? Because the, they don't regulate the technology providers, they're regulating something different. So I'm not sure that fully addressed your question, but it doesn't really change a whole lot of what, what we're up to, but we want to be um, helpful as we engage with our, our customers. Well, thank you all so much. We're out of time for questions, but the good news is I think the panelists are all um, sticking around for a little bit to network and socialize. So if you want to get um, in the weeds with them on something. I'm sure they'll they'll enjoy having a conversation with you about that. Um, but I hope you'll all join me now in just giving a round of applause and thanking our panelists so much.